Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back at uh, Southwest Wings Birding and Nature Festival. I, I believe this is my 11th South, South, Southwest Wings. Wow. Um, great. I've presented on um, a range of topics over the years. Uh, jaguars is one, uh, mountain lions another, and, and about bears. And I think this is a uh, kind of a popular one, particularly with birders, because as a demographic, for lack of a better word, birders are more likely than the average person to see a bear because you're in the back country and in really good bear habitat, which from our standpoint is elevation 5,000 and above, although they can and do come down lower uh, based on circumstances on the ground. Um, we're dealing with a bear right now, I'm not gonna say where, that's doing a lot of dumpster diving in Southeast Arizona. He collapsed a, a camper's tent on him over the weekend and uh, we're gonna make every effort to trap him and move him to a more suitable location. Uh, there are others as well. And I'm gonna show you some recent bear sightings from 2021. Uh, there's been some uh, different things occurring this year. I thought the way we do this is I've got a number of bear artifacts with me, one of which is right over my shoulder. Uh, this bear was hit by a car, salvaged by us, and repurposed for education and outreach. Um, it's a young bear. I can tell that by its ears, which relative to its body appear rather large. Um, as bears get older, their heads get bigger. And so their ears start to appear smaller relative to their head. I would say this is over two year old bear. Um, um, and the only way I could be certain about its age is by checking its teeth. When that's, that's the surest way to gauge by wear and tear how old the bear is with an older bear having uh, more yellowed and dull teeth and a younger bear like this one still having some pearly whites and some fairly sharp teeth. Um, so I wanna get these artifacts out and on, on your desk. First off, if you happen to see a sign like this, if you're out in the back country, you may see a sign like this from time to time, bear warning, campers and hikers. If you see a sign like this, know that we put it up and we put it up not as a general warning that there has been a bear in the area and that it has been active. And we want you to take heed of that because even though they're not as dangerous as grizzly bears, they have pretty formidable claws and very sharp teeth. This is a full grown adult bear. This is rather large. I got a two hand this one and uh, fairly wide across the mid section. I can't really show you the claws too well on this guy. Um, if it were a grizzly, they'd be even more fearsome, but I can show you a track. And this is a little small uh, relative to the skull I just showed you, but this is the back paw of a bear. And you can see with those five toes and the heel pad not quite as arched as a human foot. It looks kind of human and the same thing can be said for the front paw. But what will get your attention, and I don't know how you can, well you can see it there, are the claws. You will know a bear track if you see one because of the claws. I saw one in mud in New Mexico a few years back. It really caused my pupils to dilate, my heart rate and respiration to uh, pick up. And it wasn't that big of a bear, but the claws uh, will definitely get your attention. And last but not least, we're gonna talk a little bit about bear habitat and what they like to eat. Um, these are my flashcards, I love my flashcards. <laughs> uh, this is an acorn, obviously, it grows on an oak tree. These are juniper berries. They look ripe and plump and like blueberries today. And last but not, neat, not least, a little harder to see, are manzanita nuts. If you are at elevation approximately four to 5,000, you're probably gonna see oaks, junipers, and manzanitas. And if you're there in the fall, they're gonna be pretty ripe. In fact, we had a wildlife officer who observed five bears over the weekend within a, less than an hour on a ridge in the Chiricahuas because the wild raspberries were ripe up there and they were chowing down. But in the fall, these foodstuffs become critically important to bears because they have to fatten up before 
they bed down for the winter, they don't classically hibernate. Uh, it's more of a semi-wakeful state known as topar. And uh, they need to fatten up. And if they don't fatten up, they're going to emerge from those dens very hungry. And how hungry was readily apparent to Sierra Vista in 2012. We're going to talk about that as a case study and uh, about what could happen if they're deprived of those critical food sources uh, close to the time when uh, they bed down. So I think I've got all the artifacts covered here. Why don't I go to the presentation? And uh, we'll get started. We're really quite cute up here, guys. Hmm. Um, I like to say it's not a bear problem, it's a people problem. And I, I think consistently where we have issues with bears, it's because something we human beings are doing. I always like this cartoon a lot because it told in very simple four frame fashion what the problem is. Bear in its habitat, we come in and we want to know where that bear came from. Well, the bear was here first. This is really about bears in the Sky Islands. And again, we're, we're, we're usually talking about elevation four to 5,000 and above, although depending upon circumstances, they will come lower. Uh, this photo uh, of the, our wildlife officer, Matt Brown, uh, is, is like every wildlife officer's dream. But Matt earned that moment with actually what turned out to be two bear cubs separated from their mom because he had to deal in his rookie year with a tremendous volume of bear calls in Sierra Vista because of circumstances beyond everybody's control. When we're talking about bears in Arizona, we are only talking about one kind of bear, a black bear. Uh, obviously elsewhere in North America, we have polar bears. We'll show you their habitat. We also have grizzlies. We haven't had grizzlies in Arizona since the 1930s. Their range has diminished cons considerably. And this graphic pretty well shows you what that's all about. The polar bear being largely a critter of the Arctic Circle. Uh, the grizzly bears range shrinking considerably. They were all the way down in Mexico at one time and now are predominantly found in the Northwest up into Alaska and Canada. Uh, grizzlies are about twice as big as a big black bear. Uh, you know the difference between a grizzly and a black bear because the grizzly will have kind of a, a spooned uh, snout and a hump on its back and of course that grizzled fur in some cases. Uh, black bears don't have those, either of those characteristics. I do like polar bears a lot though. They can swim 100 miles uh, without stopping and I can think of them as sea bears. That said, when we're talking about black bears, bear in mind that they come in different colors. It may be a brown black bear, but it's still a black bear. And they can even go to blonde. I'm gonna show you another example of a blonde black bear uh, in the course of this presentation. But don't be, don't be fooled. And the terminology can vary depending on where you're at. You're at. An Alaskan brown bear, for example, is actually grizzly. So this is where they are in Arizona. And you see really from about pine top up to flag, that's really bear country. It's, it's dense, good habitat because of the elevation. They're uncommon above the Grand Canyon as this graphic indicates. But then we got these little pockets, right? Uh, the Santa Catalinas, the, Rincon, uh, the Rincons, Santa Rita's, uh, the Penelanos, that's all good bear country. And we've got quite a few. The Huachucas, for reasons we don't understand, has always had a healthy bear population. We suspect that they've, 
they've come up, some of them have come up from Mexico. That's not going to be possible except to the west of Montezuma Pass because of the border wall now. Although we do have photos of black bears coming over the old 18 foot wall. So uh, where there's a will, there's a way. They're, they're such an interesting species. They're very shy and will tend to avoid people, but they're also curious. And so that curiosity gets the better of them often. What do they eat? Well, I showed you some of the things they like to eat, especially in the fall. They'll eat just about anything. Um, we're trying to entice that bear we're searching for that collapsed the tent over the weekend with everything from uh, tuna fish, uh, honey, dog food, uh, fruit, watermelon, anything that smells. That's really about how things smell. They eat insects, clearly, and they also eat carrion, uh, meat from other animals that have died. Um, they're not fishers like the uh, brown bears in Alaska, which will wait for the salmon run. But if there are dead fish on a shoreline, like is often the case at Riggs Lake on Mount Graham, they'll eat that up. And that's kind of an ongoing problem for us. I'll show you a photo of one of those bears. Um, as I mentioned, they emerge from their dens hungry and will actually eat grass in the spring just to get their uh, digestive systems flowing. You can see here some examples of, of bear dens where they'll den up for the winter. We got a little one here. Um, and then in the fall, they wanna get fat. So they're really looking for those acorns and juniper berries and manzanita nuts. Uh, where we see it, interaction with humans, it's usually because they're stressed for resources. Um, more recently, before we got these monsoon rains, at least in the Tucson area, I don't know about elsewhere in southeast Arizona, uh, we suspect they were getting into places we didn't want it to be because they were looking for water. But they'll easily chow down on pet food if you leave it out. They love bird feeders, uh, both nectar and seeds in some cases. Dumpster diving bears, really common. They also like compost piles. If you've got a fruit tree, I'll show you an example of a bear I was foraging someone's uh, apple tree in Hereford a few years back and barbecue grills. Very keen sense of smell, can smell food from miles away and will come in to investigate. Uh, why do people do these things? This is my stupid people slide, sorry. Don't do this, okay? Very, very dangerous. We've come a long way in understanding uh, bear behavior, you know, there was a time in our national park system where this kind of thing was encouraged, well, no more. Um, there, there were two fatal uh, grizzly bear attacks in Glacier overnight in one instance in the 1960s because of uh, the practice of letting bears uh, go through a garbage dump. Uh, and they were getting way too used to people and way, way too used to human occupied areas. Don't feed bears. Um, their climbing ability is pretty remarkable, as is their determination to get a food source when they want it. Um, you know, we tell people to string their food if they don't have a bear box or another place to place their food when they're camping, high above the ground, uh, suspending a line between two trees. But even that, if a bear really wants to get it, he's going to figure out a way to do it going hand over hand in this case to access this bird feeder. Looks like he succeeded. I'm not quite sure where these photos are from, but they're pretty remarkable. I don't like the expression of fed bear as a dead bear, but all too often that's the case. Back to this uh, not being a bear problem, it being a, a people problem. Males are particularly problematic. And some of you who've been in Southeast Arizona may recall a near fatal mount, a bear attack on Mount Lemon involving a teenage girl who was uh, on an overnight with 4-H, I believe it was, on Mount Lemon. Anna Kanakal was her name. Um, she's lucky to have survived this. And so our policy, and it really our hands are tied because it is encoded in policy, uh, problematic males are, are put down. Um, not so with uh, females and young bears. Uh, the, in the case of the bear we're trying to trap right now, it's a young bear who doesn't really know any better. 
We just want to trap him, get him out of there, and find a better habitat for him. What can you do to not be part of the problem? Don't leave pet food out if you've got bears in your area. Any any number of homes and the canyons running up to running up the eastern slope of the Huachucas are candidates for bear uh, interaction. If you got bears in your neighborhood, take your bird feeder down for a while. The bear, the birds will be none the worse for wear and tear and you may save a bear. Compost heaps can be a problem. They'll eat dead meat for sure. And they love those, they love to investigate those barbecue grills. Garbage, this is a big one. If you got bears in your area, put the garbage out the day of pickup if at all possible. Make use of, if you've got them, uh, locking mechanisms, bear resistant trash cans and whatnot. If you can uh, get your trash inside a shed or in your garage, all the better. And then last but not least, I mean, this is just good practice. If you're traveling in the back country, particularly if you're going alone, let someone know where you're going and when you plan to return. Make your presence known. It used to be uh, a common practice for backpackers, say in grizzly country, to have little uh, jingle bells attached to the frame of their backpack so the bear can hear you coming a ways off. Noise is always a good deterrent for all manner of wildlife, including bears. Hike during daylight hours and stay on trail. Avoid taking pets, clearly. Uh, use bear pepper spray. That's a handy thing to have. It may seem a little pricey because you say, well, I'm, I've never seen a bear, so why should I have it? But if you're, if you're concerned about it, my only advice with bear pepper spray is practice using it once. If you're under duress and encountering a bear, you don't want to fumble with that bear spray and accidentally spray yourself. And the way to use it is to spray it toward the ground so it will waft up into the nostrils of the bear. Don't spray it high because he may just duck under. And then watch for those bear signs I showed you. That'll tell you what the bear activity is as we track it. Keep a clean camp. Here's, here's another one of these bears looking at the suspended stuff. Don't leave food out when not in use. Use those lockers. Um, keep your keep yourself free of food orders food odors one of the things that would be common is right you're cooking food in camp uh, you go to bed you're wearing the same clothes that you wore to cook not a good idea the bear's going to smell that might collapse your tent there is that use those bear resistant containers i think this is a case in the extreme i don't know anybody who can set up a camp you know a uh, hundred yards uh from the tent to the fireplace to the rope lines, but you get the idea. And as I mentioned, what our policy is, the problem with relocating bears is half return. And we've had bears walk up to 100 miles to get back to the place we moved them from because they were being a problem. It works sometimes. Let me show you how we do that. It's a funny bit. Um, had a bear up on Mount Lemmon in 2017. Uh, we chased him for two months. It was a young bear. We think it had gotten separated from its mother. We think mom may have been hit by a car. Really didn't know its way around. It was hanging right around cabins, around uh, campgrounds. And so here he is. Let me maximize this if I can. Climbing into our bear trap. The bear trap in toward the front here has a bucket, which we load with food and it's got loaded with a spring. So when the bear touches the bucket, the door closes on him. So he's investigating this. We put a trail camera on this trap. Fumbling around a little bit. Let me see if I can show you the end game on this.
Well, we're having a little trouble doing this, but the bottom line is this bear closed the door on himself. He didn't access that uh, bucket in the back. He just shut the door on himself. So that's what we do. And um, they spring the trap door on the back. We hook the trailer up to a truck and we move them to pre-identified locations that are a little further away from people. But that said, they try and get back. I'm gonna show you some examples. When we capture them, we will ear tag them so that if we have to deal with them in the future, this bear's been tranquilized, it's not dead. We can identify that individual. The tags are color coded and numbered so we know the region that the bear was in and which specific bear it was. So onto our case histories. Um, 2012 was a challenging year for bear activity in the state of Arizona. The worst thing that happened that year was a woman died about a month after being mauled by a bear in Pine Top. What happened was she was staying at a condominium complex on a golf course in Pine Top, was out walking her dog about 10 o'clock at night and there was a bear in a dumpster that she was passing. The bear was startled, reacted instinctively, attacked her. Uh, the injury sustained in the initial attack is not what killed her, uh, she, but she developed a severe bacterial infection uh, from the bites and, and subsequently died from that. There were other bear attacks that summer as well. Payson seemed to be ground zero. None of these rose to the level of the pine top attack. Um, but anytime a bear uh, injures a human being, it's a very serious situation requiring an immediate management response on our part. Um, and then we had bears in Sierra Vista, and we had a lot of bears. The reason we had a lot of bears is because of the monument fire the summer before. Uh, that fire burned hot and fast. And in, in places like Ash Canyon, it literally looked like the surface of the moon, uh, 30,000 acres, 47 square miles, largely on the eastern slope. And unfortunately, this one photo depicts a bear which was probably not overrun by flame, but overcome by smoke. We don't lose a lot of wildlife in wildfires typically, unless they become entrapped, say uh, on the, a wallow fire, we lost 40 elk that got trapped in a box canyon, not overrun by flame. But what burned up were these oaks and the junipers and the manzanita at elevation four to 5,000. So when they bedded down for the winter, they were hungry. And they were even hungrier when they came out of the den in 2012. And by July, they were starving. So this was the beginning of what turned out to be 100 bear calls, not 100 bears, obviously, because some were duplicate. Uh, but we took 100 reports of bears in, in human-occupied areas between July and October of 2012. This guy climbed an apple tree in Hereford. He was uh, well within sight of the general public because he drew a crowd of 100. Uh, while we tried to figure out how to coax him out of that tree. I'm gonna show you photos of treed bears later. Uh, the thing is, what kept the bear up the tree was 100 people on looking, including uh, TV news cameras. Everybody was rooting for the bear. Um, we, he finally came down on his own, but unfortunately, the bear was a problem for the rest of his life uh, and caused a lot of issues on Fort Huachuca. Very distinctive looking bear, Here's a blonde bear. Uh, this coat is, is unusual by any reasonable standard. The, the shorter hair and darker hair in the front, the blonde long fur in the back. We always knew which bear it was. Should have nicknamed him. By September, things were getting pretty dire. Uh, you know, we had 10 calls about bears in 72 hours. This was one uh, up a tree in Miller Canyon. This unfortunate bear was actually in someone's backyard at that location, Foothills Drive in US 92. We were successful in capturing the bear. 
And we moved into the Patagonia Mountains. We figured that was a safe distance away, although there was always the possibility it was going to come back. Unfortunately, it crossed the border from the Patagonia Mountains, and um, Nogales police put it down. Uh, un unfortunate, possibly unnecessary, uh, but that's what unfortunate. That's unfortunately what can happen when bears that have re been relocated. Uh, decide they want to return. If not to the place where they were, they want to continue to forage human source food. And also in September of that year, we had an elderly couple awakened in the dead of night by a bear pounding on their back door. Um, that bear had to be lethally removed. Anytime a bear tries to enter an occupied structure, it's um, a serious matter because the behavior likely will be repeated. And then we had a bear that was running around the golf course at Fort Huachuca while golfers were out there teeing up. Uh, he actually had the audacity to interrupt the picnic by a bunch of soldiers on the fort um, and also charged one of our officers. So we had our work cut out for us in 2013. Uh, interestingly, we, I got approached by someone from the Boy Scouts, a young man on the right who's doing an Eagle Scout project and said, you know, what, what do you have for me? And I said, well, you can help us do public outreach in Sierra Vista in the spring because we're concerned we're going to have the same kind of problems in 2013 that we had in 2012. So the Scouts dutifully went out, they posted signs, they went door to door, uh, they passed out uh, bear wear brochures, talked to residents about how to live safely with black bears, reminded them that uh, in Cochise County, at least, it's illegal to feed wildlife. And um, the problem is we also engaged with the city council uh, twice to brief them on what we had done, what we were doing, and what to expect. Uh, since it's usually a people problem, not a bear problem, the best way to solve it is to get the community engaged and the Sierra Vista community engaged very well uh, with us and, and helped help solve the problem, as did the habitat returning to some semblance of what it was. So we were back in business the following year. We managed to save these cubs in Parker Canyon Lake. Unfortunately, its mother was poached. We got the bad guy and moved these kiddos to a zoo. This is the same wildlife officer who had that horrendous year fielding 100 bear calls in Sierra Vista in a three month span of time. Matt Braun, hats off to him. And then Matt got to rescue two bear cubs that got separated from their mom on Fort Huachuca. Uh, some soldiers were out for a run, the bears were hanging out. Mom went up one tree, the cubs went up another tree. Uh, we had to fish the cubs out of, a, uh, out of that tree with the help of the Fort Huachuca uh, Fire Department. We Finally caught up to mom later, got them all back together. Uh, good news all the way around. I love the photo on the right. The little bear on the right seems to be looking at me, looking at us saying, I don't know what I did wrong. Really cute. But back to bears and burgers. This bear in Madera Canyon in the Santa Rita Mountains was giving us fits for two months now. I should say something about, particularly for this audience, about what you do if you should have an encounter of this nature. Um, there was a birder a few years back, um, very experienced guy in the outdoors, who was up Madera Canyon doing his thing, and he was charged from a distance of 50 yards by a bear. And he followed our standard guidance, which is this, stand tall, make noise, wave your arms, throw objects, try and deter the bear by getting it to think that, that you are more dangerous to it than it is to you. And by gosh, this guy did everything by the book and the bear kept coming. Um, it pulled up short, 10 yards distant from him, turned around and went right back the way it came. Um, we found out later that that bear had a cub with it. The guy who stood his ground didn't see the cub at the time but she turned up later. And so it was purely defensive on the bear's part, it was protecting its cub. If you'll know you're in a dangerous situation with a 
bear if it exhibits that kind of behavior. A bluff charge is common with black bears. They'll come running straight at you and then pull up short. They also like to make a huffing sound when they're alarmed. They may smack their lips. That's another indicator. And standing up on their hind legs is an attempt not only to see a little better, but to look more intimidating to you. So if you see any of that, uh, you need to take some kind of action. And if you can't get that bear to break off its approach, back away. This was a bear that consistently would not break off its approach uh, to hikers, including a few birders. And what had happened with this bear is the first time it was observed, it was seen by a woman who, had, who was birding. She sat down beneath a tree uh, to have a drink of water and something to eat. She took off her backpack. And when she looked over her shoulder, this bear was up a tree right above her. She left the area immediately, but she left her backpack behind and the backpack had food in it. So the bear quickly figured out that backpacks have food in it and he would approach every hiker with a backpack that he came across. This went on for two months. He was very elusive. Uh, we searched for him by helicopter. We searched for him by uh, on foot. Uh, he would have a close encounter. We would race down to Madera Canyon, uh, deploy wildlife officers looking for him, never could find him. Uh, this is one such encounter. Uh, the person had a presence of mind to stop the photo. The bear was not going to clear that trail. And the problem with a situation like this is simply this. This all occurred in this general area between uh, Josephine Sato and Bellow Spring. This is where the bear was hanging out. The Forest Service closed the trail twice. If you know Madera, there's two ways you can set out uh, from the parking lot here. And they closed the trail here and they closed the trail here. Well, that's fine, except there's other ways into Madera, right? And you could come in from the other side of the Santa Rita's and access that same area. So it really isn't, trail closures aren't, really an effective tool, but we tried it. And while the trails were closed, the Forest Service sent some hotshots in there to do some trail maintenance. And uh, they took their backpacks off while they worked. And sure enough, that bear came at them and got into their backpacks and even scared hotshots out of there. And he could be destructive. He went as high as the observatory on Mount Wrightston, tore apart a car, what finally happened with this bear is two birders were up high, up around Josephine's saddle. The bear, they had backpacks. The bear wouldn't uh, break off its approach. They tried everything that we tell people to do. They started to back away, came back down the trail. As they went, they were telling other hikers that were going up that there was a bear up there that wasn't clearing the area. And they looked through the trees and the bear was flanking them all the way down the mountain. Its curiosity probably and its interest in those backpacks containing food uh, made it so persistent that it trailed them out. And there's a group of 10 people actually coming down all the while the bear was flanking them. Unfortunately, that bear had to be lethally removed. It wasn't leaving. It was getting increasingly dangerous. Its, its behavior was escalating. These are classic shots of what we deal with on a year in, year out basis. On the right, we have a bear uh, that wandered into a picnic area, cleared out a bunch of picnickers. Uh, that bear eventually moved off. The bear in Summerhaven in 2017, peering into a cabin, had actually walked 100 miles from the White Mountains, actually Globe, originated in the White Mountains, was moved to north of Globe, headed due south, came up the backside of the Santa Catalinas, got to the top, was looking into uh, cabins in the Summerhaven area, and then went back down the mountain on the southern slope, winding up jumping through over fences and backyards in the La Paloma subdivision, caused um, a lot of concern. And then the photo on the bottom is Mount Graham or in the Riggs Lake area. You see the wildlife officer there
How long have I been unmuted? Just a second. Okay. Good. I was talking about the Barrett Riggs Lake. For whatever reason, this year, we've had a lot of bears climbing bears. And you might have seen these guys on the news. And we really thought this was an indicator of a horrendous uh, year with bears. The bear in Douglas up the utility pole uh, occurred on Mother's Day, caused quite a stir. Uh, a few weeks later, we had a bear asleep up this utility pole in Wilcox. Uh, it, he, the bear was spied by uh, uh, a Arizona Public Service utility crew. Crew. They went up in a bucket to wake the bear up, <laughs> and he finally climbed down. Uh, the bear in Benson was at a car wash. You can see a vehicle passing by in the background on that photo. Uh, again, this was a drought thing. We think the car wash, being a water source, was attractive to this bear. And then in Tucson, just a half mile up Pima, the Pima Canyon Trail, we had this bear peering down at a hiker. And, and here's the deal, it just as I mentioned before with the bear up the tree in Hereford, we have a lot to do with the public in terms of educating them about treed bears or bears up utility poles. If you wanna get a photo, great, but just know that the longer you stay under that tree, that the bear's gonna stay up there until you clear out. They are routinely startled up utility poles or trees by passers-by vehicles and whatnot. And it's just a matter of time. They really don't wanna spend a lot of time in that tree. Last but not least, if you're interested in this topic, there is a fantastic documentary, Making the Rounds of Film Fest, festivals, mountain film festivals, wildlife film festivals in the West called the Bears of Durango. And it is really worth watching. Um, the, uh, our counterparts in Colorado did a six year bear collar study specific to Durango because of the frequent interactions with humans and bears in there, dumpster diving bears, bears getting into garbage and so forth. And uh, they would go into dens, as we have done in past studies, uh, tranquilize and then collar sleeping or topor bears, bears that were in that semi-hibernating state, and then follow their movements. And they, they found a number of different, very interesting findings that I think are, are useful to an agency like mine. For example, when natural food sources are available, logically, bears tend not to get into human occupied area but when there's a, a natural food shortage like there was in the summer of 2012 uh, they're going to get into mischief in residential areas but the thing about the durango study that was very interesting is they knew exactly where to go from year to year as if they had been imprinted to know where those likely food sources were going to be the other thing that was interesting about the durango study was that and it defies a little bit of conventional wisdom that if you can, if a bear starts dumpster diving or getting into the garbage or doing your bird pierce, whatever it does, if you can deprive them of that source of food and there is natural food available, they will go back to it. They are not problem necessarily problem bears for life. It's just about the availability of resources in bear habitat that causes these human and wildlife conflicts. That's a little different look at this. You know, the conventional wisdom on bear behavior was that once they eat human source food, uh, they're always going to want it and they're never going to stop trying to get it. And the Durango study kind of turned that on its head. So check it out, bears of Durango. That's what I have for you. And I usually get some questions if, you, if you'd like to, uh, Ask, please let me know. I can check check the chat. I'm not sure, Mary, how you'd like how you'd like to do this. Well, we do hey, have a there. couple of questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. That was so great. Yeah, we do have some questions that have uh, come in for you. So. so we have a question from um, from Linda Yetz, who says, "Is there any truth to the idea that the colder the climate, the bigger the black bear?" I've heard this is true with mountain lions as well. 
I'm not familiar with any research to that effect that is logical. Yes, that would make that makes sense. And we, we see we see leaner creatures uh, down in southern Arizona that we do in northern, for example. But I don't know about the research to back that up. It's just I don't know. Thanks. Now a question from Lorena Charbonneau. Um, a question about attractive smells from our campsites. We go car camping for three to four weeks at a time. When we're not in bear country, we often cook and eat near the tent. The next night, we may be in bear country and we use a bear box, we put food away, etc. The question is, should we be worried that our tent might smell like food from the day before? Yes. <laughs> I, I think the answer to that is yes. Although being a camper myself and knowing how campsites are con configured, particularly if you're using a raised grill or even if you're cooking over an open fire, that's, that's tough to do. But I would say a greater concern to you as a camper is you know, your clothing, obviously. Uh, we want you to change your clothes after you've cooked and don't bring anything in the tent. In the case of the, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but in the case of the bear we're looking for right now, the camper who had his tent collapsed on him had a banana in the tent. And the bear probably smelled the banana and was trying to get in there to get it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, there is some concern about, but there's not, not an easy fix. I'd say do the obvious thing first. You know, change your clothes before you uh, climb into that sleeping bag and make sure you don't have any food in the tent. Um, and I mean, I think, I think also in that case, the bear is going to find more attractive than your tent, the grill that you were using or the campfire uh, ring that you were using to cook food if you're cooking on an open fire. Hmm. Okay. We have a question from um, Bonnie Mays. Uh, she, first of all, she says your photos are great. Oh, thanks. Such an interesting lecture. She enjoyed it a great deal. And is the population, the bear population, is it growing? It's, I, would, I would characterize it as being stable. Um, when pressed for an answer, how many bears are there in Arizona? Uh, we typically say 2,500 to 3,000. Uh, so in southeastern Arizona, divide by six for the number of bears. Um, the, the populations are, are very healthy in the mountain ranges here uh, of, that have elevations above 5,000. Uh, but I would not say they are, are growing, nor would I say they're diminishing. They're just stable. Okay, okay another question from Lindsay Yetz. Where are the pockets of bears in southeast Arizona um, as compared to the larger areas up in the north? Where are these pockets? And are you concerned about inbreeding with such small little clusters? Mm, that's an interesting question about the inbreeding, but I'm, I, th I would say we'd be less concerned about this because the mountain ranges are, are pretty vast. Uh, where are they? I can, I can tick them off. They're in the Chiricahua, uh -oh. Anaritas, Rincons, Catalinas, Galeros, the Sky Islands that are above elevation 5,000. Most of those ranges are, are pretty big and there's some connectivity. Well, let me give you an example, the Catalina bear population. We had this big uh, bighorn fire last year that burned easily three quarters to uh, two thirds of the range. So where did the bears go? Well, we think the bears, because the Catalinas and the Rincon Mountains, which largely is a national park, the Rincons, are connected by Reddington Pass, they might have cleared out and gone over to the Rincons, but because they're large, they're pretty territorial and they like their own turf, when the fire and all the people and the aircraft got out of there, they probably moved back. So there, there's some, con there, there's, we look for the connectivity that gives them the space they need to, to move around. So no, not, not no, the, the, the populations are healthy enough and large enough, and the mountain ranges here are large enough that that inbreeding is not a gr of great concern. Okay, thank you. A question from Marie Davis. Is there any worry that a bear in a tree might pounce on you as you walk by? Highly unlikely. Uh, that bear 
if that bears up a tree or a utility pole, something scared it up there. Back to this, you know, shy but curious nature. I always try and remember that about black bears. Um, it's not comfortable with that passing car or your presence, and it is seeking refuge up there. They're not. They're not really black bears. Are not typically that aggressive, in part because they're omnivores, right? And and they're not. They're not meat eaters like like a grizzly, although grizzlies will eat other things. They're less aggressive, and they're really trying trying to avoid you. It's their curiosity that, that gets the best of them, or perceived threat, like the hiker, the birder, who is in Madera Canyon that got charged at a distance of 50 yards. That really wasn't the bear being aggressive toward uh, the birder. That was the bear trying to, to protect its cub. You usually got to peel back some layers on this to see the instinctual behavior kicking in. And, and so um, the bear, for example, in that fatal bear attack in Pine Top, the bear was startled, right? Because the, per the, the person was walking their dog in the parking lot. The bear's in the dumpster. It all of a sudden looks up. There's a human being and a dog and it attacked. Okay, another question from Marie Davis. Uh, are non-food but smelly items okay to keep in a tent, something like, say, toothpaste? And I'll expand on that. Is there anything, any smells that bears really don't like? Bear spray. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think probably I would include in that, oh, say, pine salt or other things that are cleaners, for example. I would not be concerned about having toiletries in your tent. That's not, that's not attractive to them. But potato chips, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Any more? We do have uh, some questions from Judy, Judy Kaplan. What's going on in the Western states with killing female bears and cubs during hibernation? I'm sorry, I'm not, I didn't quite follow the question. What's, what's going on in some of the Western states with killing the female bears and cubs during hibernation? I'm unfamiliar with that issue. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of it. It's definitely not happening in Arizona. Political thing. Don't know whether, yeah. yeah, whether it's um, grizzlies or black, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Judy, you can answer. I mean, you could send your... Um, more questions in the question box, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, and she also asked about uh, if the bears are classified under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, are they stable so hunters aren't overly hunting? It's gonna vary from state to state. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Yellowstone grizzlies, which had been listed, have been delisted. Uh, what, what the status of well, if they're in the national park, they couldn't be hunted at all. Um, I do believe there's a limited limited bear hunt and gri of grizzlies in Montana and Wyoming, but I just don't I just don't know. That's the only species of black bear that's listed that I'm aware of, and that was a long effort to restore grizzlies to Yellowstone. Um, is there any idea how many bears we have in the whole U.S.? Oh God, I'm sure we could Google it. I'm sure there's an estimate. The okay. parents might, it's just not as, I mean, there are species that we can get a relatively good handle on. Uh, pronghorn antelope being a classic example. We can, we have radio collars on some pronghorn in Sonoida. We go out and we count them. We send a whole bunch of biologists out there and then we count them and then apply an algorithm. Bears are a little tougher to count. Bears and mountain lions are two species that are very hard to count. So any, estimate of the population would be at best an estimate. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that, that answers Judy's questions. Thank you, Judy. Um, and we have another question from Bonnie. Um, do we have an agreement with Mexico about migrating bears? Mm, not to my knowledge. I think it sounds like there's more to that question. Um, Again, the last time that, that, that there was a study done on this cross-border movement by bears and mountain lions, it was conducted by us in 2009. Um, 
Unfortunately, that study didn't get very far because in the course of it, a jaguar nicknamed Macho B was inadvertently snared and uh, Macho B met a bad end because the whole process, process of what we tried to do was collar him because there was a real interest in getting some data on jaguar cross-border movement and the whole thing shut down. The Wachukas though, um, I mean, we, we, we don't know this, but year in and year out, they've got a great, there's a great bear population there. And we had long felt that, that they were coming up. Uh, we were having some in-migration from Mexico to that range. Well, it's gonna be interesting to see now because the 30 foot border wall is in place largely at the southern terminus of the range, Montezuma Pass area, although there's some passable uh, territory to the west of that. Uh, we'll see if uh, that bear population diminishes, but you know, I, I don't think it will. Here's the thing to remember about the Huachucas. There's limited road access and there's, there's only one road to the top, the Car Canyon Road. And there's a lot of hidden springs and drainages in the, in the Huachucas. So it's really, it's really perfect for bear country. That Western facing slope uh, is, a, is a great place for bears. But as far as an agreement, no, I, I, we probably, uh, we work on cross-border studies from time to time, but um, nothing formal. I'm not sure how that would play out, actually. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you have some other questions coming in. We're trying to keep up with them. <laughs> I've got a question for you, Mark. I'll try. Bear over your shoulder. Does it have a name? We don't name critters. <laughs> <laughs> we find that unscientific. That's, un that's unscientific. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least in this office, we don't. We have sure. rescue yeah. wildlife at our wildlife center and in Phoenix, that gets named, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yogi or Boo Boo? Oh, of course. <laughs> what else? I think yeah. Boo Boo. <laughs> Boo Boo. This guy had an accident. Indeed. Okay, well, we have a question here from um, L.M. Levy. Um, this is about the Douglas bear. Um, mm. The paper said apparently the bear was headed to Whitewater Draw. Um, and the, they're asking, oh, really, yeah. why, why wouldn't it go back up the mountains and higher instead? Why would it head? Uh, well, actually, I, that, I don't know how it was reported in the paper, but I was the source of that information. He was using the whitewater draw drainage to move westward. And our feeling about the Douglas bear was that it had come out of the mule mountains. And so the surest way to get back to the mules was to follow the whitewater draw drainage. It wasn't actually in the wildlife area. It did turn up uh, later um, uh, along that, that probable route of return to the mountains. Mm -hmm. Someone got some photos of it. Uh, but yeah, he, he, was, he was using the white water. Hopefully he got back to the Neil Mountains. He had quite a harrowing experience on that uh, telephone pole in Douglas, poor guy. Must have oh, done, wow, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, um, well, yeah, another question from Judy. Um, actually, how migratory are bears? How migratory are bears? Yeah, how, how migratory are they? Do they, uh, do they migrate particularly or are they just wandering? No, that, that, that they will occupy a territory in a given range, but circumstances may force them to look elsewhere. The example I gave of the bighorn fire and of that displacement of bears to the Rincons, but the point being they would come back. Yeah. You know, they would clear out. It's just, it's all, it's again, it's a people problem, not a bear problem. With all that activity, the fire, the helicopters, the firefighters, they didn't want to hang around. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there is unsuitable habitat, they're very capable of moving. And this hundred, you know, this hundred, these hundred mile bears are no joke. And we moved one from the Catalinas to the extreme southeast corner of the state off Geronimo Trail and it wound up in Texas Canyon trying to get back to the Catalinas. Yeah. So part of it's about their movement is really about, is the habitat still suitable? And part of it is I want to go home. Yeah. If, yeah. if they've been relocated for being a nuisance, half the time they want to go home. And how they know, how they know the route mm. is beyond us, but they do. 
Another question here from Daniel Kozlak. Um, is the highest density of bears in the Santa Ritas in Madeira Canyon, or are they found fairly evenly throughout the range there? Well, I think the reason it seems like there's a higher density in Madeira Canyon is so it's so well used. Yeah. But, I, but the distribution, uh, in all probability, is fairly even throughout the Santa Ritas. It's the same way with mountain lions in, in Sabino Canyon, right? Are there that many mountain lions in Sabino Canyon or are that many people? Well, it's really about the people. People get more reports, you get more sighting reports, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Madeira's great for birds and bears. <laughs> birds and bears. Birds and bears. That's yeah. it. Well, I think that's uh, well, all the questions. Thank you so much, everybody, for all your questions. Yeah, thanks for the Today, questions. And thank you, Mark. And thanks thank for the you. answers, Mark. And thank that's you very right. much for the talk. If any of you uh, really people listening missed the beginning of the talk, it is being recorded and we will be putting it up onto our website. So you'll be able to access that through our website. There'll be a link to it. It'll go up on YouTube, uh, but that might take a day or so to get up there. Yes. But, um, yeah, thank you everyone for attending and uh, a wonderfully interesting talk as ever, Mark. Ah, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all again next year. We Maybe in person. Yeah, in we, we, person. We, we hope so. We right. hope so, really do. All right. Right. We'll take, take care, care, Mark, and we'll, we'll see you around. Okay. Have a good festival. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you for attending. Bye, Bye. for now. Bye-bye.